Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. Once again, we have been for the last 10 years on a single trip through the Bible, book by book, verse by verse, story by story. Now we kind of want to go back and review just a little bit, much more quickly, yes. <laughs> as to, to see what we have kind of discovered, learned, come to believe. Uh, let's go to 1 John, 1 John 4. I want to start with verse 7. My beloved friends, let us continue to love each other since love comes from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and experiences a relationship with God. The person who refuses to love doesn't know the first thing about God because God is love. That's a marvelous first principle. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great principle. We're talking in this session about principles that we think need to be kept in mind when you read Scripture. And, and some of these principles will make the reading of Scripture more challenging, and some of these principles will make it a lot easier. And Norma started out with a verse that suggests some, a very important principle to begin with, and that's the entire Scripture is supposed to teach us about the God we worship, the God who is love. Some of you are familiar, many Christians are familiar with the fact that there are different words in the, in, in the Greek language for love. We have one word for love. We have, of course, other words like affection and, and kindness and those kind of things, caring and so forth. But in the Greek there were four words with four different kinds of love. There was agape, which happens to be the word we're talking about here. There's phileo, which talks about our philia, talking about a, the kind of love that is between members of a family. There was eros, uh, which is a word that refers to passionate love, sexual love, something like that. And there is the other word, epithumia, which talks really about emotion, something that you really get stirred up about. And it could be love or it could be something else. It could be anger but it's, it, it's, it's passion, something that you're really stirred up about. And I've already mentioned that the, the, the word love here, God is agape. What do we know about that word agape? Anybody? Some churches call themselves agape churches. Yeah. Okay, you think they're more loving than other churches? Mm. Well, it was certainly mean a love or regard for some p other person without any hope of any return. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In other words, I do it, I give my, their love and affection to somebody without saying, but I want something back. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'll invite you over to my house to eat, but I'm expecting you to invite me over to your house to eat next week, right? No scorekeeping, no accounting books or no. records. No. So this is sometimes called principal love. It means doing what is right because it is right. That's the and kind that's, of stuff. That would be righteousness. Yeah, then. yeah, which is closely related to, yeah. to biblical kind of love. Or even doing what is right when you know you're going to get in trouble, when it's going to cause other people, maybe Or you to be in big trouble. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, you still have to do what's right. Uh, Paul was out there preaching the gospel in Rome when he knows a little way down the street is Nero, you know. What do you think is going to happen in time? <laughs> you know, you're going to get your head chopped off. Mm. You know, yeah, agape love to me is is something that 
we humans don't have really the capability of doing. I mean, when you look at Christ at the Last Supper, knowing what Judas was going to do and loving him completely, mm -hmm. we don't have that capability without some help. Well, yeah. there's a lot of people uh, in the military, don't they give um, purple stars or bronze or whatever for people who uh, do things and they just have no regard for themselves. So sometimes in crisis it does come out. Called a Medal of Honor. Yeah. Medal of Honor, yeah. Well, there's Purple Hearts for being injured in the call of, in the line of duty, Bronze Stars for being brave and so forth, and, mm -hmm. and then a Medal of Honor if you really, really do something remarkable. Well. You, you wonder what is in those people that causes mm -hmm. them to do that. Well, I, don't you kind of think that love is just, I mean, all these loves that you're talking about, it's a value that you have for a person. I mean, you value that person. I value this person. I value that person. If you really value the person, you're going to react to them a certain way. Yeah. So. Yep. Okay. So we've already mentioned in our last session the, the, the core principle. We want to say that each we believe that each story, verse, each part of Scripture says something important about God. And it is God's message to us. So the basic principle is, okay, what's God's message? What does it tell us about Him? And this God from the Old Testament is the same as the God from the New Testament. We have to put all that together. And sometimes it's a challenge. Sometimes it's not very obvious. Yes. The example that has been suggested recently is found over in the book of Psalms. Let's just take it. You know, we, we love the words, you know, God is love, but right in our Bibles is a verse that very few people are aware of, or, or, and it's found in Psalm 137. And the it's last verse. The last verse. It's actually a <coughs> lament of Israelites in exile. These were, these were Israelites who were in exile, and the Babylonians came along and said, oh, you guys, you're supposed to be good songsters. You know how to sing. You've got made these songs. Sing us a song from Zion. Sing us one of those famous Jewish songs, you know. And they were making fun of them, of course. And, and the last verse in that, Psalm 137 says, Babylon, you will be destroyed. Happy are those who pay you back for what you have done to us, who take your babies and smash them against a rock. Now, what does that say about God? It takes some doing to figure out how that contributes to your picture of a God who's love. Well, well is yet, that human emotion? That's human emotion? Very much so. What it says about God is that he took people with that mindset and worked with them and brought them back out and he didn't give up on them. Mm -hmm. are, are you saying, Norm, that God meets us where we are? Mm -hmm. uh, even better than that. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> He'll overlook where we are sure. and, and, and keep giving us opportunity. Because going through that experience where they had that much hatred to the, to the Babylonians, still down in there someplace was an ability to respond to God, and God wasn't going to go until well, that was uh, yeah, fulfilled. That, that horrible message there in that last verse, mm -hmm. can we say that that was God-breathed? Well, I think we have to. Sure. Well, I think it was God breathed because it expresses a sentiment that many of us have in our own lives about a situation. And when it's there, it just simply tells us that God still loves us, is still going to work with us, that we're going to let Him, and He's going to meet us where we are. Mm -hmm. I think when we have stories like this, it, it ultimately shows God in a much better light. Sure. It shows that He sees the human races, what they are. Yeah. Well, whoever wrote that knows that. Because even us, when we pray to God, we, we do it politically correct to God, you know, even though we know deep inside that our emotions are even worse than the words that we're praying to God. This person here just said, hey, the Lord knows me anyway, I'm just going to say it, mm -hmm. you know. And that's one of the important messages from this psalm. If, if we sometimes feel like these words we just read, you might we can, we, yeah, yeah we, can, we can look at those words and say, well, 
somebody somebody else felt like that in the past and God put his words in the Bible. And that's the part that's inspired, yeah. wouldn't you think? Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily how they politically, if it was politically written correct for God, you know, the fact that God will take you for who you are, like Roland says, mm -hmm. take you from where you're at. Yeah, well, and, and if, if the Bible was always politically correct, it would probably be much shorter, and it wouldn't be a whole lot of interesting reading. A lot of very not colorful very valuable either. What? Not very valuable. Not probably either. not very valuable. A lot of very colorful stories would be missing. So then we can say to God, God, this is how I really feel. Mm -hmm. Please help me. Because this is how I really feel. And, and God has to change your heart. Mm -hmm. We can tell God that, but we probably better not tell other people that <laughs> sort of thing. So we won't make a we yeah, won't we, make a gripe session around the yeah, table here. Right? I'm not gonna tell Myra, um, I'm going to take your baby and smash his head against the rock, especially since my baby yeah, too. Yeah, be yours too. So. Well, don't, have, a, don't have an open mic and re being recorded. Yeah. <laughs> and end up you're on the you're internet. talking about a gripe session. Did, wasn't that what Job did part of the time? He was griping it, about it, why in the world was I ever born? Yeah. I, I mean, know. he never he never cursed God, but he sure griped about his situation. But we don't. I, I, I have a feeling that you would gripe too. Oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and well, I don't know. Maybe I'd be strong enough to be politically correct and say, <laughs> well, you know, I, I know yeah, bad things are happening to me, but I know you're, you've got a good reason for it, you know, and all that. That's a good political way to say it to God. But, but we, no, but he did I don't say, like it. But he did God, I don't what, like it. But he did say what was right about God. Remember Job 42.7? Yeah. Well, yeah, and he acted like right. what was right about he did, God, he too. He didn't uh, sin by cursing God. Yeah. But you don't hear a big booming voice from heaven saying at the end of this psalm, oh, well done, well spoken. Yes, but it's in here. <laughs> but that's the beauty. We see a lot of stuff that I don't think God is all that pleased with. And we do. I don't think that, that, he, that he says, now I'm so glad you expressed that because you really needed to say that. I think he'd have been a lot happier if they'd have put their trust in him a lot, long bef lot longer oh, before right. that, and they wouldn't have even been in this position. Right. Well, even when you have trust, though, doubts always hit you. Right. And you can complain to God about that. You could say, I hate having to fend out these, these doubts, God. You know, what's wrong with doing that? In fact, I did that on one prayer, and it shocked everybody. How can you talk to God like that? Well, he knows what I'm thinking anyway, so why don't I just say it? Yeah. That's what the Psalms do. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Well, which brings us, of course, to our second principle. Always remember that it is the context that determines the meaning of every passage in Scripture and the meaning of everything we read everywhere. You know, if you, if you read about Afghanistan, you need to understand something about Afghanistan to know what it's talking about. You have to. And it's the same way with Scripture. When you read what's it here, like we just read in Psalms, you're not expecting the same thing as when you read the Sermon on the Mount. The context was different. Or the last three chapters of Judges, and so forth. You know? You're saying that people need to know history. Mm -hmm. And sometimes history, as it's presented in a lot of schools, is about the most boring thing in the world you can study. But you do need, and it becomes interesting when you study the Bible, but you need to know where they lived, the times they lived, and what the culture was. What the culture time. was. Yep, to fully understand it, you do. Mm. Yeah. So, context. Uh, if, if you're not sure about the context, dig up in an old trunk in the attic sometime, whatever, like this, and pull out a letter that you wrote 20 years ago or 30 years ago and read it without stopping to look at the dates and see if you can figure out what it was talking about. It's a real exercise. Why in the world did I say that? <laughs> you know, a letter that you owe yourself. Well, the next pr principle we come to. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think any of the Bible writers, after writ writing what they wrote, went back and read it and said, why did I say that? <laughs> it's quite <laughs> possible. It is quite possible, yeah. I can imagine John, after having written Revelation, went back and read that and says, 
I know that's what I saw, but what does it mean? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Tell me about it. Well, there's different kinds of context. What are the different kinds of context that we're dealing with in Scripture? You know what the different kinds of... We've, we've already talked about the historical context, haven't we? How big is the historical context? It can be very important. Yes? To our understanding. The historical con context is from the beginning in heaven. Mm -hmm. When uh, Lucifer and all the other angels were created, Rebel. when Lucifer rebelled in heaven, and then when this earth was created, yes. this whole controversy and what's to come. Mm -hmm. So the entire span of human history is one context, right? Mm -hmm. What other contexts are there? Well, I want to just elaborate a little bit more. For instance, there are some chapters in Isaiah, and I'm thinking of Isaiah 28, which is interpreted many times as the end of the world. But Isaiah is not talking about that. He's talking about God's relationship to Israel and Judah. It has nothing to do with the end of the world. Yeah. That, you, you got to keep that in context in mind, otherwise you're going to go, really go astray. Yeah. Well, God is not the author of confusion, so the Bible must have an overall organization and theme. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, the other context, which I sort of expected someone to mention, but no one is, has yet, so I will mention it, is the word, the sentence, the actual context of the writing itself. What do the words language. mean? The language context in, this, it's in that setting. What do they mean to the ancient people who first heard those words? Do we, can, we, can we put that together? Can we figure it out? So the, the literary context is also very important in understanding Scripture. Well, moving on. When reading the Old Testament, remember that it is the same Jesus. Here's a huge challenge. It is the same Jesus Christ who came and lived as a human being in the New Testament who was the God of the Old Testament. And we've read these verses again, but John 5, 39, Luke 24, 44, and 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4, just say that very thing in so many words. And in two of those cases, it's Jesus himself basically talking, saying, that was me. For a very clear picture of what this Jesus Christ is like as a person, read the Gospel of John. And why would, why would John be particularly a good representation of Jesus' character? Well, for, compared to the other three Gospels, John is certainly seems more concerned about the character, the personality of Jesus than the other synoptic Gospels. He wants to get that point across. Who is God? That's his, it seems to be a special burden. And when you go to 1 John and the other two, two which he authored as well. That's the same motivation, but he has God's love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I wonder why he had such a burden for that. Don't you think it was because this is relatively soon after Christ was here, resurrected, and there was the majority of people that thought that whole notion of a guy dying and re being resurrected was nonsense. And he was doing his level best to get people to understand that Jesus was real, that Jesus was who he said he was. The, and Paul was fighting the same battle. Every place he went, he was trying to convince them that, that Jesus was the real deal. Well, John was living in a pagan world, yeah. and, the, and the pagan gods, you had to uh, propitiate them. You had to make them feel good about you, otherwise they were going to harm you. Yeah. You had to appease them. You had to appease them, yes. But unfortunately, they, would be, they do the, what was it, um, Romans 3.25, Jesus was a, pro, pro, a propitiation, to as God to be, to be appeased, and that wasn't... That's really a pagan concept, what you do. It really yeah. is. It's not In reality, fine. is the job any different today? No different, because God doesn't change. Mm -hmm. God doesn't change, and by and large, people don't change all that much. They're just as resistant to what He really is today as they no. were then. Our language, our culture, whatever has changed, but that... But God doesn't change. Basic, basic issues have it. Basic human behavior has not. Right. You know, you, when you read John, though, aren't you reading a from a person that was closest to Jesus? Mm -hmm. 
So he's going to have some insights. Yes. Different than the other ones. Well. Mm -hmm. yeah, but you could say, on that regard, that each one of the apostles, disciples, after Christ had gone, and we asked each one of them personally. They each give us a little bit different mm -hmm. perspective of who How Jesus is. How boring would this book be if it was all written by one author? That's right. Yeah. Well, I didn't mean that one was better than the other, but right. you know, you look, you read at First John at the beginning or the f beginning of John. You know, he probably spent a lot of time asking him, asking Jesus questions that the other ones probably didn't really well, care about. I you might be more interested in what the disciple that stood at the foot of the cross and stayed with Jesus had to say, rather than the ones who were running every which direction. Mm -hmm. Hiding up in that room, scared to death and that, that come and get him. That could have been evidence right there that he was closer to, the, yeah. to Jesus because and, he stayed there. Yeah. And taking care of the mother of Jesus. That's right. At the same time. Yeah. You know. yeah. Well, it's interesting that one of the first places where a Christian church, <clears throat> not, not a Jewish branch, but a real Christian church really got on, Got on fire, we would say, with the gospel, was in the what we would call Syrian city today of Antioch, and that was a place where Paul became a member, Barnabas was a member. They got sent out from there. Silas was a member. They got sent out from there, and it's interesting. Norm, you earlier mentioned about they weren't always not everybody was happy about what the Christians had to say and about and so forth. It's very interesting in in, in Acts chapter eleven. And I'm reading 25 and 26. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he took him to Antioch. And for a whole year, the two met with the people of the church and taught a large group. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. Now, today we say, my, isn't that wonderful? I'm proud to be a Christian. When that name was first invented, it wasn't to be proud about. They were saying, there's those stupid people who, who, who believe in this dead man. I mean, what could he possibly do for them? Of course, you know, they rejected the idea of a resurrection, you know. So Christians are people who, those dumb people who followed a yeah. dead man. No. So, but there it is, right there in, in What in country was Antioch in? Syria. Syria. What, what today we would call Syria, yeah. So Syria. So um, Christians were first called Christians in Syria. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. There are two Antiochs, though. Yeah, there's, there, there's one in, in uh, south, uh, eastern uh, Turkey as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's there, the, uh, it, and probably, that's probably where Paul came from. There are probably others yeah. as well. Yeah. Well, now we're going to talk about some very specific things that we need to really nail down here. When faced with what appears to be a contradiction or a passage which is very difficult to understand, what do we need to do? Read on. Read on. Keep reading. Sometimes the local context will help. Sometimes it seems to get worse as you read on. Just look at Judges. <laughs> judges, yeah, especially. And, and, and many times the Bible will explain itself. Just, yeah. just don't panic. Just keep, keep on. Keep reading, yeah. When you really cannot seem to understand why God does something in a certain situation, make it a note of it. And the questions that you have, consult a commentary. They often ignore some of the most difficult problems. I found that very interesting in commentaries when you say, man, there's a real challenge. That's a real question. Let me go see what the commentary says. <laughs> Zippo. <laughs> <laughs> they often ignore some of those difficult problems. Anyway, they talk to someone else about it or look for other similar places in other parts of the scriptures. Often seeing the problem in several different settings will lead one to an understanding of such problems throughout all the Bible. That is tantamount to saying compare Scripture with Scripture. Mm -hmm. um, how do you tell the difference between somebody who is comparing Scripture with Scripture to arrive at truth from someone who has what they believe is truth already in their head looking for Scriptures to substantiate it? Well, the way you tell the difference is the first guy accepts all of Scripture and the other guy says, that's no use, throw it out. <laughs> well, that's something different. That doesn't mean the same thing here as it did there. Yeah, we had an example of that in the early church, Marcion. Mm -hmm. And he uh, rejected anything that was Jewish mm -hmm. in the Bible. So okay. he had a, no, sorry, he had a, just had a very peculiar, uh, you might say, 
written liturgy, you know, books that he would accept are parts of books and so forth. I've had that happen to me uh, in the not too far distant past where we were going through something that I thought was was uh, comparing scripture with scripture and they just turned to me and said I think that person had already had an idea in their mind and they're just fishing for text to believe no. it. No. I just heard something recently that many of the Christian uh, uh, religions now have thrown out Genesis 1 through 3 completely. I mean they just think it has no nothing va of value in there. And mm -hmm. So you leave that part out of the paradigm as we discussed earlier. Uh, yeah. And you, you're, you're going to end up with the wrong in, in some real problems. Destination. Yeah. <clears throat> well, if you're looking for different places in Scripture where to compare with, it's often useful, useful to have a cross-reference Bible or margins that show you other places where the same idea is, is presented. And that's an easy way. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, in our generation, what I do is I use a computer and I have about 40 or 50 versions and 40 or 50 sets of commentaries and if you find something you don't, you're not quite sure on, you just click on it and bang, all those things come up. So you can really cheat. Or if you're just looking at the cross-reference Bible, you hit the, the cross-reference <coughs> and there's the cross-reference. You can look at it right there. And what happens when you have two commentaries that uh, contradict themselves or, or at odds? <laughs> You're forced to choose. You keep on reading. You keep on reading. Oh, or you read a third commentary. No, that's not, yeah. that, that, that's not uncommon, you know. Yeah. I've had that experience many times, you know, yeah. different viewpoints. So it's often useful to have a Bible with that kind of cross-reference in it, in the footnotes or in the margin, to see where similar situations have occurred or other passages have dealt with the same issue. That is particularly important for people who want to be a leader of a groups like this. and. As we move along, we'll talk about ways in which you could lead out in a book-by-book -book group to the Bible and have an absolutely marvelous experience in the process. But in this, in this process, we, need, we must recognize that there is no part of the Bible that is useless or should be overlooked or ignored. And uh, unfortunately, some very important parts of the Bible have been overlooked and ignored. Um, do you have some examples of that? Yes, I can give you some examples. John 15, 15, we've already referred to. John 16, 25 to 27. Let's look at that for a second, because that'll give us a real example. And then I'll give you one that was quite different than that. John 16, 25 to 27, and I'll read from my Good News Bible. I have used figures of speech to tell you, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples on the last night. I've used figures of speech to tell you these things, but the time will come when I will not use figures of speech, but will speak to you plainly about the Father. Now, if Jesus came here to reveal the Father, and now all of a sudden he says, at this last moment, I'm going to speak plainly about the Father, that ought to be, that ought to be like the number your, one text for everybody, shouldn't it? Get your attention. Yeah. When that day comes, you will ask him in my name, and I do not say, notice the negative, I do not say that I will ask him on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you. He loves you because you love me and have believed that I came from the Father. So that's very interesting because so many churches that I know about feel that the essence of the gospel is Jesus is up there pleading with the Father for us because if he weren't pleading for the Father, with the Father for us, what chance would we have? And Jesus himself says, I'm not going to do it. And a pastor at one time is, is attributed to have said, that's damnable heresy. Yes. When he says, oh, I don't need to pray to the Father for you. But we, we, we need to suspend your ideas here just a moment. We'll be right back.
welcome back. We're so glad that you stayed with us, um, haven't gone away. We were talking about the question that no part of the point that no part of the Bible is useless or should be ignored. Now, there's some parts of the Bible you might even want to ignore. Um, and one of those is found way over in the book of Judges. We're not going to spend a long time reading it right now because it would take quite a while. But let me just point out something about what it says. Judges, and look at the last three chapters, chapters 19, 20, and 21. Now, this is an absolutely awful story about a Levite who had a second wife that was known as a concubine, that this, this woman was abused until she died, and he sort of threw her over his donkey and carried her home and cut her up in pieces and sent her around to the tribes. He says, look what those people did to my secondary wife. And it started a war and wiped out the tribe, virtually wiped out the tribe of Benjamin. Now, why would a story like that be included in Scripture? Well, context. Well, what was the context? Who wrote this book and why would they write such a book? And the answer, I'm sure, is, is partly represented by the fact what it says in the very last verse of the book of Judges, there was no king in Israel at that time. Everyone did whatever they pleased. Now that ought to teach us something. But more than that, it's quite likely that the book of Judges was written as a, his, a history book for the, for the students to study in, 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 in the schools of the prophets. And you have to give an explanation of what happened to the tribe of Benjamin. Somebody has to explain that. You know, there, there's almost no Benjaminites left. How did that happen? And you, you can imagine with a story like this, if nobody spelled it out and explained what happened, the story goes, did you hear what happened to them? You know? King Saul was a Benjaminite, wasn't he? Yes, he was. So he was a very small group that he ended up becoming, he came from a small, group. what was left of their tribe, became king of all Israel. So, yeah. so anyway, what this tells us that <clears throat> God says, that's the way it happened. It's better to spell it out, let everybody read it to know the truth so that you don't have those people speculating and making the story twice as bad as it already is. <laughs> I think there's another big thing that it says about God. How low you can get and still God didn't say, ah, fooey. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And yet at the very last verse that you read, the author did himself or herself, didn't really understand what the issue was. He thought the issue was, we need a king. Yeah. And that wasn't at all. Yeah, exactly. And what a horrible state. <coughs> they did what was right in their own heart. His heart felt that doing that was right. How far they had fallen. Yeah. And we, earlier in, in our discussion, we talked about doing what is right because it is right. Now it's doing right is right because I feel like it. It even gets any worse than there because in this particular case, the people, because they originally went out, they were defeated by the Benjaminites, they approached God at least three times, maybe four times. What shall we do? And God is quoted there as saying, destroy the Benjamites. Do mm -hmm. you believe that? This is inspiration? Well, it's part of the record. Part of the record. Right. Well, it's, it's good to have the, the range in the Bible. Mm -hmm. I mean... It we possibly, have the you have the range, <laughs> but if the range wasn't there and they took it out like you suggested, maybe they ought to take it out type of thing, there could be a situation where things could get that low again, you know, and then they could say, oh, we're way past the Bible. This can't do anything for us anymore. Yeah. But, but um, it's gone probably as low as you can go mm. as far as humanity goes. This is one of those where... You understand the good, the magnitude of the good, by the depth mm -hmm. of the rot. <laughs> yeah, and to think that God was still working with these people. That's right. Some trying to trying to sort things out in the, in the middle of that mess. How great is God? Yeah. And God was so totally misunderstood on that. Yeah. Even, and but people do that today. God told me to do such and such as an excuse for. Well, and, and remember some really way out pe examples that have been in the news in the last few 20 years or so. 
the guy who took a baseball beat, baseball bat and beat his family to death because he said, God told me to do that. Well, you know, I mean, we, 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 we would say he, he needed a, a psychiatrist. But we, but we got to remember that Jesus is very clear mm -hmm. in the Gospels that Jesus is the author of the Old Testament. So we need to understand what is written in the Old Testament in terms of the teachings and life of Christ and no other. We quoted uh, Josh, or excuse me, Judges earlier. Go back to Judges 3, and when the ch children of Israel had gone into uh, the land of Canaan, and it was only that the generations of the people of Israel might know war, mm -hmm. that, that because they hadn't been tested with, with, in battle with the other uh, Canaanite nations, but God wanted them to learn what war is like. Well, well the, did, did war God in heaven. Did God want that, or is that what they wanted? Well, uh, only that the Jericho. That don't you think? Don't you think God would have preferred for them to do the Jericho thing? Oh, sure, but sure. but but He still takes responsibility for following through on on it. Yeah. Well, your first text for that is Exodus fourteen fourteen. Mm -hmm. I will do it. All I want you to do is be still. Then we go to Exodus twenty three, and He says, "I will send my angel, my hornet, ahead of you." In other words, you. I can. I have a whole bunch of texts here in my Bible on that. Every one of them just simply says, I don't want you to stay still. I will take care of them so that every one of the battles would have been like the battles of Midianite and Gideon. There was in Joshua uh, 5, there's a thing where they heard the marching of, mm -hmm. in the trees, you know. Or there was hail, another case. God takes care of it. Hail didn't kill them. They thought that hail killed them. They did. You know, God would have taken care of it. Now, what about the part in Canaan though where God told them to destroy everybody, everything, mm -hmm. everything. And, mm -hmm. and in fact, they didn't really want to do that. But they got in trouble when they didn't do that. Yep. That wasn't the first <laughs> plan or the second plan or the third plan of God. That was the plan Z. Plan but did, Z? But you have to ask the yeah. question, did God really tell them that? Yeah, uh, and, and then when they went and did it and left a few left over, what right. was the point? Roland gave, uh, gave me a new prayer. God send hornets out in front of me to take care of my enemies. Yeah. <laughs> Is that what they say in the Old Testament? <laughs> yeah. Hornets with big stingers. Yeah. <laughs> well, God, has, God has many reasons for doing what he does. Our feeble, finite minds can only discover and comprehend a small fraction of those reasons. We're going to study these stories for the rest of eternity. We're just getting a taste, just a tiny taste what this is all about. I mean, imagine studying a Bible story and God say, okay, are you ready to read this story? Okay, sit still and look at the screen right away. And God would say, here's a 3D living presentation. Let me show you exactly what was happening. You can see not only what was said, what was done, you can see the thoughts of the people, what they were thinking when they did it, and see the whole thing. Their emotions. Uh, you're, you're, you're sitting there with your mouth hanging open. I mean, Steven Spielberg would turn green. Ah, but you see, in the heavenly videos, they not only have sight and sound, they have smell, taste, sure. touch. Excellent. You get to experience it. You're right there. Well, yeah. what, what, the I've, thoughts. what I've heard that's interesting, we are the only planet that has, that has sin. And so we will enter into heaven and relate to others <coughs> in the universe what it was like to live under the dominion of Satan. Is mm -hmm. that correct? That's mm -hmm. And so, um, of course, a lot of them did live under the dominion of Satan in heaven for a little while. For a That's while, true. so. Yeah. But the focus will always be the glory of God. Mm -hmm. How and He how, helped us how out. How He got it. How He did it. How He got us out of this. I can't imagine that we'd spend the rest of eternity focused no. <laughs> entirely on 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 the rot down no. here. Although I think. It has to be there, but I, the I, focus will be how great God is. And when we see those stories, God will say, and here's the part you didn't know anything about. Yeah. And the story will just grow, and there will be so much more to learn from each of these stories than what we know now. Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll get a perspective we don't have right now. Yeah. Sorry. Well, I don't know how often you've read a Bible story and, and, and tried to ask yourself, okay, how many different reasons can I think of to explain why God did what he did here? It's a good exercise. Try it sometime. Well, the Bible is written in man's language. That's our next principle. It's written in our language and not in God's language. If God wanted, wants to, under, to 
communicate with us, he has to act in ways and speak in a language we can understand. And often this has caused God to reach lower and lower, just as you were talking a moment ago, Norm, to communicate with us on our level. If we're down here, he's, he's got to get down here and talk to the ants, you know. Clearly it was not God's, and I'm not talking about A-U-N-T-S either, I'm talking <laughs> about A-N-T-S. Um, clearly it was not God's plan ever to have sin, <coughs> the flood, slavery, killing, the monarchy, or idolatry. But he had to deal with people who were involved in all of these things and much worse. Therefore, we should not assume that because God appears to have acted in a certain way in a certain situation that this is his ideal for all time. And that would save us a lot of heartache, a lot of conflicts because there, how many people, how many Christians say, well, that's what God did, you know? And well, isn't that like a, a parent that is down in Skid Row looking for their kid, and they never in their life wanted to be on Skid Row, or, but they're doing it because they love their child and they want to rescue. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, the, you know, time after time after time, God says, keep my commandments, do what I tell you to. <coughs> When they, do this, the when they do this kind of thing, you never, have, you never hear, go thou and do likewise. But sometimes people put those verses together. <laughs> they try. <laughs> people. People do, not God. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, as we're moving on, the central question or theme of the Bible is not about, and here's a really important point, is not about whether God has greater authority or power than the devil. The devil admits that God has infinite power and it scares him. And where is that verse found? It says here, James 2.19. You're cheating. <laughs> James 2.19. Let's look at that for a moment. A small book of James, way over at the end of the Bible, right after Hebrews, a few, few books before Revelation. James 2.19. And James is explaining things, how it's like, what it's like in the Christian church. And he says... I will show you my faith by my actions. In, in, well, let me read all of verse 18. But someone will say, one person has faith, another has actions. My answer is, show me how anyone can have faith without actions. I will show you my faith by my actions. Do you believe that there is only one God? Good. The demons also believe and tremble with fear. I mean, Lucifer knows perfectly well that God exists. He lived with him. We don't. We have no idea how long he lived with him. Probably millions of years. He he, he probably knows more a lot more about God than we than ever we thought. Do. Yeah, yeah. Than we do. So how is he going to respond? What's he going to do? What did he do? I mean, you know, Revelation twelve. Well, was, that's what the Bible is a story of: of mm -hmm. what God did and what Satan did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And some of the demons knew who Jesus was. A lot of them, yeah. And Jesus would say, you know, keep quiet. Have you ever wondered why he would say, I mean, the, the, the statements that the demons made about Jesus were a lot better testimonies than what his disciples said or certainly what the you Pharisees said. You are the said. Son of God, yeah. they said. Yeah, mm -hmm. right there. Yeah. Why would the devil say such a thing? Uh, for the same reason that Balaam couldn't curse Israel. Mm -hmm. They opened their mouth, the truth came out, the blessing. And a demon opens his mouth, God, it, it, it may be that God's message comes out. Boy. But why did it, they tell him to be quiet? Well, he didn't need that from them. Didn't need it from them. No. Well, then why would they even say anything then? Here, here's one possibility. I already suggested that we're not gonna, we may not be able to think of a lot of reasons, but here's one. We ought to be able to figure out at least one reason for everything that happened. And I would say that Jesus probably told the demons to be quiet for two reasons. One, they didn't know enough about him to go out. I mean, Jesus had cast the demons out of them. And so they might think, well, man, I know what that's all about. I can talk about demon possession. I can talk about being saved from demon possession. Let me go out and tell everybody. And I suspect Jesus would say, hold on. You already know anything yet. Just it's better for you to keep quiet for a little while. That's one reason. The second reason uh, in, in that respect is it's possible. It's, well, it's, it's not only possible. I'm sure it's true that 
these demon-possessed people were well known in their local villages. People know who they were. So, and if it looked like they were somehow connected to Jesus, people would say, aha, now we know where he gets his power. He's connected with those demon characters. And so Jesus would say, you know, just keep quiet. Don't talk about what I did for you. Be thankful for what I did for you. Just leave. So possibility that the demons had a method for why they were doing that. It could have been even to stir up problems, yep. you know, for Jesus, mm -hmm. which they kind of did with Paul exactly. in some places. Yeah. <coughs> well, going back to our question now, the central question or theme, I'm going to read this sentence over again, the central question or theme of the Bible is not about whether God is greater authority or power than the devil. The devil admits that God has infinite power and it scares him. We read the verse, James 2.19. The central question, listen carefully, or theme of the Bible is, who is telling the truth? And who can be trusted in the great controversy over God's character and government? This controversy involves all the intelligent beings of the universe, not just the people living on this planet. And some of the verses that would that illustrate that are Genesis 3, 1 to 5, Job 1 to 2 and 38, Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. Uh, let's look at just a couple of those. We only have a few minutes left. Someone read Ephesians 1. Let's, let's start with verse 7. Ephesians 1, 7 to 10. And someone else will read Ephesians 3, 7 to 10. Can we do that? Ephesians 1. 7 to 10. So I'm sorry. This, this yeah. whole thing is about is God telling the truth and can God yeah. be trusted? Who, who can be trusted? That's right. Ephesians 1, 7 to 10. <coughs> Someone have it? In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us. For he has made known to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. So what was the purpose of the plan? To bring harmony, to bring at one be between the beings in the heavenly places as well as the beings on this earth. How would how could you possibly do that? Demonstration. W what's the problem with with us getting together with the angels? God has been accused. The mm -hmm. accusations accusations were in heaven many <laughs> ages, or or at least an age or mm -hmm. more be earlier, and uh, God has had to demonstrate what how He really is. Such as the creature in the tree and saying God's a liar. Mm -hmm. So God has been accused and. You can get on either side of that accusation. Some believe it and some don't. Mm -hmm. Okay, someone want to read Ephesians 3, 7 to 10? So what that suggests to us is that this controversy, this argument is much bigger than just our earth. God says he's going to bring the entire universe back together. Re Ephesians 3, 7 to 10. I was made a servant of the gospel by God's special gift, which he gave me through the working of his power. I am less than the least of all God's people, yet God gave me this privilege of taking to the Gentiles the good news about the infinite riches of Christ and of making all people see how God's secret plan is to be put into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the past ages in order that at the present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers of the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. The purpose of all this was to do what? Educate the powers Educate of the heavenly world. The heavenly world. Educate the heavenly world. I think we talked about another verse that talks about that somewhere, didn't we? Colossians 1, 19 and 20. Well, let's read that one, and then we want to go to 1 Corinthians 4 9. But look at what we're right there. Let's look at Colossians 1, 19 and 20. <clears throat> I'll read that one. For it was by God's own decision that the Son has in himself the full nature of God. So who's the Son he's talking about? Jesus. That would be Jesus. 
through the Son, then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself. God made peace through his Son's blood. What's he talking about there? Jesus Christ. Talking about the crucifixion. The crucifixion, the death of Jesus, and what that, all of that means. God made peace through his Son's blood on the cross and so brought back to himself all things, both on earth and in heaven. What did the death of Christ do for the beings in the rest of the universe? Demonstrated how God is, first of all, demonstrated that, the, that God is always righteous and will do, always do the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, and how evil and destructive right. sin is. Right. Yes. And these are the people who used to be associates of Satan in heaven. I, I'll go back to that creature in the tree. Yeah. Creature in the tree said, you won't surely die, God's a liar. And Jesus died on the cross to prove that that was wrong, mm -hmm. that he was not a liar. Yep. And that sin causes death. Death, that's and, it. And, and how God is involved in this. When he says, you're going to die if you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Serpent had never, uh, Satan speaking to the serpent, had never seen death. Mm -hmm. So he, he says, you're not going to die, which was a lie. But... Uh, he packaged that with the truth. Yeah, you're going to be like God, knowing good and evil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, look at 1 Corinthians 4, 9 to give us another part of the picture. 1 Corinthians 4, 9, for it seems to me that God has given the very last place to us apostles, this is Paul talking, like people condemned to die in public as a spectacle. You know what the word for spectacle is in Greek? Theatron. Theatron, the theater. We are a theater. We're on the stage for the whole world of angels first and of human beings. And what do you do in a theater? You tell stories. Mm -hmm. So the onlooking universe has had thousands of years. First of all, they see lifespans of about a thousand years with, with mm -hmm. uh, Adam and Methuselah and all those. They live. Then after the flood, about 120 year lifespans. They mm -hmm. see how evil lifespans work. Mm -hmm. Well. Uh, just a, two or three more principles to go through, and I think we're going to make it. In some <laughs> ways, the Bible is like a, and think about this, the Bible is like a final examination where we are given the answers, but not the questions. How does that sound? In order to understand why God has given the answers that he has given, we must figure out what the questions are and were. So that's a backward examination. What are you talking about? Well, what I'm saying is, what we see as stories, we see God doing the things he does, and we see Satan doing his things that he does, and we say, why in the world did they do that? There must have been something <coughs> going on somewhere that led them to do that. What was it? We have the answers, we have the stories, we have the thing being played out here, but what was going on behind the scenes that led to that? Okay. Okay. Why we needed those demonstrations. Yeah. And people can get many, many of these questions on your website. Mm -hmm. T-H-E-O-X dot org. <laughs> That's right. Right there. So, while our human minds cannot possibly comprehend all there is to know about God, nevertheless, and here's another huge and very important principle, our minds are the only instruments we have for thinking about Him. You can't think about Him with your heart. You can't think about Him with your liver. You know, these things have been suggested in the past with your intestines or something else. You think about him with your brain, with your mind. God always seeks, I'm sorry, for this reason, God always seeks to speak to us in ways that make sense to us. And these are words found, written by the founder of the Adventist Church, or one of them anyway, very important person, Ellen White. She said, God never asks us to believe without giving sufficient evidence upon which to base our faith. God never asks us to do what? Believe. Believe without giving sufficient evidence upon which to base our faith. His existence, his character, the truthfulness of his word are all established by a testimony that appeals to our reason. And the testimony, that testimony, this testimony is abundant. Yet God has never moved the, removed the possibility of doubt. Our faith must rest upon evidence, not demonstration. Those who wish to doubt will have opportunity, while those who really desire to know the truth will find plenty of evidence on which to rest their faith. And that's in the small book, Steps to Christ, page 105. And our final principle, 
when you think you've understood a given story adequately, then it's time to, to, to spread it out, to really st start going into the, the depths of it. As Gary was trying to go us into, into, take us into the depths earlier, try to imagine what you would have done in that story, in that situation, if you were God. Also try to imagine what you would have done in that situation if you were Satan. That's a real challenge. That's a, <laughs> I tell you, it gives you some real mind scratchers when you take some of the Bible stories and you say, okay, what would you have done? You with the bright ideas, why did that happen like this? Okay, what would you have done? If you were the devil, what would you have done? I'll give something to think about for a while. So, um, it is often easy to sit back and criticize what God apparently did until you try to think of the, some better way to handle the things in that context. And the, maybe the premier example of that in the Bible would be the story of the flood. Why did God find it necessary to send a flood and wipe out all but eight people? Well, if you stop and think about it, what was the level of comprehension of God down through those generations just before the flood? How many of them were paying any attention to God at all? None. Maybe Noah. Yeah. Yeah. One or two people seemed to care about God at all. If he had just left things alone, said, well, let it go. How, long, how many more generations before nobody would be listening to God at all? One more. Probably one more generation. And the, the number of people who would be paying attention to God would have been completely gone, non-existent. Here but there's the another aspect to that story. Yeah. Because God really worked, tried to save everybody. He yeah. saw that this catastrophe is going to occur. We can't say that God did it, but he saw it was going to occur. So he wanted to save as many people as possible. Just about all of them rejected him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how many got on the ark? How many people got into Eight. the ark? Eight. Eight. Noah, his three sons, his wife, and their wives. And they weren't all saints either. Look what happened afterwards. They probably did it because Noah said, get in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were hundreds of years old, so they should have been able to think for themselves, but this is quite likely. So we have reviewed very briefly some of the most important principles we think need to be considered when reading your Bible. Stick around. We'll try to apply some of those principles in the future. See you next week.